On today's episode, we get to talk to Dr. Anthony Dunnigan, who is the Vice President and Chief Medical Information Officer of Valleywise Health in Maricopa County, Arizona. So Dr. Anthony, welcome to the show today. Brandon, thanks so much for having me. Great. So you were a practicing physician for many years, and then you moved into informatics. And you have a degree in biomedical informatics, which is my degree as well. So this is awesome. We get to talk nerd out on informatics stuff. But I'm curious, how did you make that transition? And why did you make that transition from uh, being a, a, a physician into more of the informatics space? Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I know no, no two of us have gotten here the same way in these roles. Uh, <laughs> you know, true. I just, I was in the right place at the right time. I was a young resident at the VA when they turned on CPRS, uh, back, back mm. before most people knew what EMR stood for. So I was one of the guys who would be on call, uh, doing an internal medicine call late at night and playing around with, you know, just enough mums code to be a little dangerous and, and pulling in a vital <laughs> sign into my note. And I was like, this yeah. is amazing. And plus people can read, read my notes, you know, with, they don't have to read my scrawl and they can read it from anywhere. So I, I, I was pretty passionate about the power of, you know, that very early technology at a, at a early stage in my career, uh, sort of a bit before it became a field. And of course now we have board certification and everything. So that really right. lit the fire for me. And I just, I've had opportunities to kind of deepen my knowledge and get into various technology implementations and, and, and it's led me to where I am today. Were you already kind of a computer nerd before you started tinkering with the, with mumps and uh, the, the VA EMR? I would say so. I, in, in college, I was a demonstrator of the Apple Newton, which if people remember that, oh, it's, a, it's yeah. a long ago predecessor to the iPhone. Uh, I think I sold one of them in a year and a half. <laughs> But I would sit there, you know, while pe trying to pull people in and it had very basic handwriting recognition and things like that. Yeah. So I've always been a little bit of a geek for sure. Right, right. And that's, that's uh, what it takes. Uh, the, the joke is that I have a background in genetics uh, and then you know, informatics. And so the joke is I'm both a geek and a nerd. And that's, uh, I think that a lot of us in informatics can say that as well. I can appreciate so, that. Right. Now, do you still see patients today or are you truly focused on the IT side of things? I do. It, it, it keeps me honest and humble. I work with the internal medicine mm -hmm. residents. So I, I, you know, I get in there and use our EMR and, and teach them really, you know, probably my strength is, is teaching the, the young learners, students and residents how to use technology, whether it's voice recognition stuff or telehealth, you know, or basic EMR tutelage. Uh, they, they get some of that now in, in medical school. Um, which is great. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm seeing people now come through fairly adept at, at, at basic EMR use. So it, it's fun to now kind of get them up to the next level with some of these tools. Right. Uh, they're all trained on using Facebook and, and Snapchat. And so getting them to document stuff in, uh, you know, in EHR is not that much more to do. Indeed. You're right. So, um, what is what are some of the biggest challenges you face uh, as a chief medical information officer re with regards to managing data or connecting with patients uh, that that you you struggle and 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 face every day? Well, you know, it's funny. Some some of the challenges remain over a decade and a half where I've been involved with technology and informatics. Uh, you know, I, I'd say we have a very good tolerance of the EMR. And, mm -hmm. and, and the EMR vendors have worked hard on usability. You know, I've talked to human factor engineers that, that work at some of the vendors and, you know, they're making, they're trying to make it easier, reduce clicks, reduce scrolling. Uh, and, and I'm very thankful to that. And, and, and those, you know, when they roll out those upgrades, they play very well, but I'd say basic usability remains a concern. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, we've spun up an efficiency program. We're trying to get people out the door and get them home. Uh, to be with their families and not turn their computer on at 10 o'clock at night and finish charting. And so, oh, you know, tools so, that allow so them it's to a do efficiency that. for the, the providers and documentation and stuff. That, that remains near the top of the list. You know, if you look at physician wow. burnout, which is of course a, a huge problem and has only intensified during the pandemic, uh, you know, three of the four top causes of burnout are technology related. So we try to address those. Tell us a little bit about ValueWise Health and, and the patients uh, and the population that you care for. The Valley's huge. So if, if you've been to Phoenix and Maricopa County, you know, it's an hour across 
the valley right. in any direction. So uh, we've got a very diverse population. It's a safety net system. We, we essentially take all comers. Uh, Medicaid is a large book of our business. I'd say upwards to 60%. We have a lot of patients that, that, are, that are cash paying without insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a smaller book of business of Medicare and private insurance. A very diverse population. Um, many, many, many patients whose first language is not English. Uh, we have a lot of refugees oh. in the valley, hmm. so um, it, it's it, it, it's it's an amazing environment. It, you know, it's an incredible mission. It's a great teaching hospital. Uh, you know, I've I've been passionate for years about getting technology in the hands of patients, even with all those caveats, right? So things like the the patient portal, the personal health record, right? Uh, and this was another one. And I, I you know, in those first days where we were spinning this up, we were very cognizant of, of how are our patients going to use this technology? How are we going to make it work for them? It's got to be simple. It's got to be simple for the providers too, mm -hmm. on both ends. And, you know, there's obviously going to have to be some facilitation and, and warm communication there. Right. So let's talk about your uh, involvement uh, and introduction to telehealth. Had you been doing telehealth previous to COVID or is this something that, that came more recent for you? Yeah, we had been discussing telehealth for years. We mm. certainly, as, as a county safety net health system, and, and you know, uh, other parts of Arizona are massive without specialty care. So the, the benefits of right. telehealth in the state are, are huge. Uh, up, up north um, in Northern Arizona, uh, the Flagstaff area, which is actually the second largest county in the U.S. by land, uh, they've been doing, they've been a leader in telehealth for 20 years. So we've been, we've been trying to get this off the ground. I think probably, you know, our early thinking was it was, it was a fairly heavy handed, you know, heavy technology play. We were, we've been trying to figure out the middleware piece, you know, how do you connect one system to another? And so we'd had a lot of those conversations for years and years, uh, and had been working to spin up some pilots and, and I'd say we were sort of dabbling in it. Right. Uh, and then, and then COVID hit and that's what really prompted you to, all right, we got to really figure this out and do something. What, what was that experience like? Uh, I, I've never seen anything like it in my entire career. It, it literally <laughs> changed overnight. The, the, everything changed. Uh, in fact, I'll never forget. It was, it was March 17th, 2020, it was St. Patrick's day when, uh, the, the office of civil rights sent out that now infamous memo basically saying, Hey, you, you can use telehealth. You can use just about anything. You, know, you can FaceTime, you can Skype, Facebook messenger and just whatever, it's all just good. do it. Whatever you have. Yeah. There was, there were a few things yeah. they actually specified you shouldn't use like TikTok. They actually called that right, out. Right. Um, but you know, <laughs> it, it was pretty much all fair game and you were going to get full per diem yeah. for a, for a typical, you know, E&M level office visit. And, and that literally changed, you know, the, the business rules changing overnight really lit the whole thing on fire. In that same memo, there were a, a short list of sort of semi-sanctioned applications. Doxy, of course, was one of them. Right, um, right. And so that, that, you know, within I'd say a matter of four to six hours that day, we had, we had a shell of a pilot in place. Oh, that's amazing. And, and that, that's a big thing because a lot of the hesitation pre-COVID was, uh, uh, is this complicated to use, got to make sure stuff is HIPAA compliant, but also we're going to do all this work and, and have this huge capital investment to have this expensive telemedicine system. And then we're not even sure we're going to get paid for it. So there's just high levels of, of bare entry, little uh, amount of rewards for a lot of the larger health systems. And overnight that, that flipped like this, easier to get in, just do whatever you can use and you will get paid for it. And now the, the, the economics of it completely changed overnight. That's exactly right. I always think of it as a three-legged stool, um, technology, operations, and business. We had most, if not all, of the technology. Um, right. The, the business rules, as you say, were very cumbersome, convoluted, hard to understand. There's various codes. Some of the codes were open. Some weren't. You know, Med Medicare, Medicaid, private payers all had a different take. And then honestly, we didn't have a huge operational pull. Uh, there was a lot of interest uh, and, and sort of some pet projects, I'd say, but uh, suddenly overnight, you know, the business side 
became dramatically simplified. Uh, and we had a huge operational pull. You know, those first 24 to 48 hours, we had a desperate need to deliver care to people in their homes, keep, keep people with chronic conditions, but, but well out of the system and have that right. capacity for patients that had symptoms out there and were concerned about COVID. So it was really an immediate congruence of those three things. So as you were rolling out telemedicine to your organization, what was that experience like? Yeah, those first few days, we got a few people doing pilots at the platform. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried to pick people in various spaces, uh, some ambulatory docs, primary care, specialty care. Uh, we looked at a few use cases on the inpatient side, and the, ex the experience was incredibly positive. And in fact, it, it, it's one of those rare times in my career where word of mouth was so strong that, that we mm -hmm. had people asking why I didn't include them in the pilot. <laughs> 48 hours after, you know, getting a few yeah. people in. So, yeah. Um, and I think it was smart to bring, uh, to have a various set of folks, uh, you know, family doc, internal med, mm. pediatrician, uh, OB clinic, uh, some of the surgical subspecialties. So uh, I, I think of that 16% principle, you've probably heard that. If you can get 16% of folks engaged in something and, and to buy in, you'll sort of get that inflection curve going in the right way. Uh, so it, the ramp up was incredible. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I've, I've got a graph of it. It's, I've never seen anything like it in my career. I mean, and you know, to think a year and a half later, going from zero to 250,000 visits, uh, obviously we've, we've, we've now got a steady state going, but those, that right. first, I'd say four to six weeks, um, it, it, as a CMIO, it's, it's an adoption curve I dream about. Oh yeah. I bet. Um, we, we can relate so how satisfied are your patients and providers in this change and movement into telehealth? We were concerned about that. You know, it, mm. as a technology, we've been trying to get off the ground for years, obviously. We wanted, we wanted it to work well, ideally on day one, or certainly the first few months. Uh, we actually did a very early survey back when we were utilizing the free version of Doxy. Uh, so this was April of 2020. So we surveyed patients and we surveyed providers with the help of our marketing department. And even, even using the free version, a lot of providers were still using their own phones. The patients were using whatever they had at their initial disposal in their homes. The satisfaction was very high. And one of the questions we oh, love to ask is, if when the pandemic ends, would you like to continue using this technology? And mm -hmm. it was like 90% Yes. I mean, again, awesome. I, just numbers I don't see, you know, I, I, we ask people, we do surveys as part of our efficiency program about EMR usage and other things. And mm -hmm. I, you, you don't see those numbers. So we knew we were <laughs> heading in the right direction very early with both our patients and our providers. As you were looking at the, uh, considering your patient population and who you, you were serving and looking at the available technologies, what, what, what is it that factored into your decision making? Yeah, we had, you know, we've got video conferencing tools. We've got the ability to communicate through certain means. We, we looked at a couple of those things that we had. Honestly, they were just very cumbersome. There's an administrative burden. Mm. Um, you know, part of my job is to work with my colleagues and other employees and, and get those things working. And, it, and that's, that's work. Uh, you know, and that's our, that's our staff and that's my physician colleagues. So we, we gave that a fairly quick thumbs down. We, we really started looking for a technology that was going to be very simple to use, very intuitive, that would need very little training, uh, highly scalable that it took, you know, took almost no thinking to get off the ground. And, right. and, and so we started looking at a few of those technologies. And of course we looked at Doxy and, and, and it sort of checked all the boxes. Uh, and that's, mm -hmm. uh, that, that principle, that concept has remained very true today, uh, as, as, as we've iterated things and gotten more strategic kind of coming out of the tactical place into a more strategic place. Right. That principle is still as important today as it was back in March of 2020. And it sounds like simplicity is a is an underlying thread through uh, everything you're looking at. So when you're looking at EHRs, how do we simplify that? And you appreciate and you value that usability aspect. That was a decision factor in your telemedicine app. It sounds like those are the things that um, that you are 
uh, that, that are important to you that you value the most. Absolutely. You know, you think how complicated the EMR is, right? I mean, it's a, mm -hmm. a common analogy is the cockpit of a 747. Uh, and, and in the past, right. we've, we've looked at, you know, how do we, how do you bring in middleware and integrate it into the EMR? And there's, of course, you know, ways you can do that. And there's apps out there and all that. With the time we had, we, we, we didn't worry about any of that. So we, we brought along a, a platform to stand alongside the EMR. We didn't touch anything in the EMR, the, the documentation, the mm -hmm. scheduling, all the billing components, we left that as is and stood this up right alongside it. Uh, and and I, I think that really allowed us to, to get this going quickly and scale very rapidly, to be honest. What are some of the challenges in usability that you and your organization are facing today that you're looking to, to fix or address or to simplify even more? Yeah, I, th I think of that on two fronts. So the, uh, uh, on the healthcare side, um, mm -hmm. it, it, there's, there's so much technology in place, not just the EMR, right? We've got, there's phone tools and, mm -hmm. uh, other business applications. So I think, and it's perfect for somebody who manages a team of informaticians, right? It's, I don't think we've ever better understood informatics like we do today. Uh, you know, when my parents <laughs> asked me, so what, what the heck is this informatics thing you do? I think people get it now, right? It's, it's, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. technology with workflows and just making things flow right. in a way where you don't have yeah. to have five neurons fire to make something work. You can, you can dedicate that brain power to healthcare. So, uh, and then the flip side of that coin is, is mm. the patient experience. Uh, you know, we certainly mm. had a good glimpse of that as we, as we really pushed to get the personal health record more widely adopted and mm. we had success there, but as, as we promoted this and, and found the devices that the patients had either in their homes or in their hands and got this working, it, it, it was, it was that experience all over again. Uh, and you hear the term digital divide, right? So we're very cognizant of, of what our patients have, what their bandwidth is, what their technical maturity and capabilities are. And we really cater to that. And, and it's a wide spectrum. I mean, I'm often surprised. We've got homeless patients that are very savvy with smartphones. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I, right, we try right. not to make any assumptions, uh, you know, when people come in the door or when we're talking to them on the phone. I'd like to like dive in a little bit more on this. So what are some of the, what are the patient challenges that you've seen in rolling out telemedicine and other technologies to patients? You know, it's, I think back to when we first started buying airline tickets online or you go up to a kiosk mm. and you remember the first couple of times you're like, I just don't trust this yeah. thing. I'm going to go up to the gate and talk to somebody. And then there was yeah. a day where the person at the gate said, you know, this would be a lot easier for you if you just use this kiosk over here or did it online. <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah. think that's where we're at with telehealth, right? So this, it's, it's really getting okay. through those first couple visits. And it's not just mm -hmm. on the patient side, it's on the provider side too. So I told all of my colleagues and I, and I still do like, you know, look, get, just get this thing up and running. You've got a lot of people here to help facilitate the experience. By the time you're two or three calls in, you'll be a pro. And, and by and large, it's true. You know, once you, once you get the camera working and you get the settings configured right, uh, it, it, you know, people are just rocketed both providers yeah. and patients. So, but we, you had to get through those first, uh, I, I call it faith, right? Once you, once you believe it'll work and you can rely on it now, now we're off and running. So. Right. Right. Yeah. You got to take that leap of faith. And once you show that you can do it, like, all right, I got yeah, this. And, it uh, actually does work. <laughs> wow. This is great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and how do you see the attitudes towards telemedicine and technology change as doctors and patients get more used to this? You know, it was, it was part of that perfect storm because there was such a pull and, 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 and people were, you know, quite frankly, desperate to get these tech, to get this technology working right away. Uh, and, and, and to have it work and, and be, you know, everything I hoped it would be efficient and easy and, and, uh, you know, on both sides, you know, you have these uh, one to two weeks in, we have these rich stories about, you know, providers looking into the homes of family members and they're looking into what's in their fridges and meeting family members. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so the, the satisfaction was huge early. And so we've really just tried to leverage all that. So, uh, you know, the work over the last year and a half has been largely, you know, how do we take advantage of this? We know it's never going away. Um, how do we continue to, to, be better telefacilitators? How do we leverage 
telehealth and coordinate that more tightly with in-person care. You know, there's things you need mm-hmm. to come in for. You need to come in for shots and certain cancer screenings right, and right. pick up your meds and get your labs done. So what's the right balance there? And that differs across every service line. Um, but we, we've, we've really rode that early wave of satisfaction to get to a, a, a pretty savvy place now, which just is remarkable. Well, and let's talk about that because, you know, before COVID, most of the healthcare industry was over on this other side, not using telemedicine at all. COVID hit, swung to the other side, and they were almost doing all exclusively telemedicine. Now it's kind of coming back. And and what is that final, like, resting point going to be? What is healthcare going to look like in the new – what is the new normal of healthcare? That – it's a great question. And I, I think, you know, by and large – 25, 30, 35%. We know a significant bulk of business is just perfect for telehealth. Uh, Mm -hmm. Certain follow-up visits, check-ins. We've swung that ratio quite dramatically over the last year and a half. You know, here in the Phoenix Mm -hmm. area, we've had a couple of these horrible waves. And of course, people saw that on the news. So, you know, we we swung it back up to 50, 60% at times. We think somewhere between... When needed, yeah, yeah, purposefully. Right, right. Um, right. We think somewhere between twenty-five and thirty-five percent is probably the sweet spot. Again, it'll differ by service line. I mean, there's services right, where right. you come in, you get a thorough in-person visit with certain things, and and you could probably have two or three telehealth visits after that. So a lot mm-hmm. of our strategic work uh, that's ongoing is is to really find that sweet spot. Mm-hmm. What are some of the challenges that you foresee in the future uh, in adapting to this new normal that still need to be overcome and addressed? Yeah, um, I'll tell you, we're aware that screening screening rates are down, immunization rates are down. So mm. you know, we talked about trying to find uh, the ideal way to connect telehealth and in-person care. We're, we're still working on that as I know everybody is. So we're, we're getting a little bit more structured around which type of visits we, we promote in person, which are ideal for telehealth. That's a huge piece of that strategic work. Um, the telefacilitation continues to mature. Things like translators, so a lot of our visits right. require a translator. Uh, we've now got a, a nice system in place where the translator can get on Doxy as part of a group visit. Um, mm-hmm. We're working with our third party vendors that help us with translation to be able to do some of that as well. And then, you know, the rules continue to change. Uh, We're working really closely with the governor's office here in Arizona to understand uh, sort of where that vector is going. Um, Mm. You know, does the the patient need to be in state? Does the provider need to be in state? Um, Some of those ramifications. Um, So I think there's a a lot of that work ahead. Uh, And then Mm. probably the biggest thing is ensuring that, you know, this incredible new mode of care that we feel will never go away, making sure we match that to quality. Mm. Uh, and, and we're doing some research and there's a lot of research nationally now on, on exactly that. You know, how do we take advantage of this technology, pair it in the right way with in-person care and, and follow metrics? Uh, you know, to me, this promotes satisfaction, this promotes engagement. I think we'll see higher quality because of that. I think those are, you know, diabetes care, blood pressure control, you know, I, th- I think of a whole host of metrics that sort of equate to engagement. I mean, this is an engagement platform. And right. It's, it's an incredible one. So I think we'll see that bear out. I suspect it'll be probably another year or two before we see that. Right. Really, uh, the, the key word there is engagement. So, you know, how well are patients engaged? And, you know, some patients, now that they've tasted the convenience of telemedicine, uh, are going to question, do I really need to come into the uh, in-person clinic for this? And, and, and we've heard stories of patients just not going to in-person visits because it's just too hard to take time off work, to travel, to, especially if they don't have a vehicle or to, to take a bus or whatever. But, but the ability just to have the ability to see a provider by uh, video increases that access and engagement with that patient that they otherwise would have skipped because it, it was too complicated. Absolutely. That, that's a crucial part of this. And, and, and it's our job to help patients 
navigate, right? I mean, it's, I, I tell folks all the time, uh, you know, coming in person and navigating our healthcare system is not easy. I mean, I, I get lost on campus. <laughs> and so, you know, we love the notion of, of telehealth as being an easier way to get care. It takes some navigation though. And so when, when folks call, we, we're working really closely with our patient access center to be able to offer them the right type of visit for the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was trying to get my son into a dermatologist and um, they were like, do you think this could be done via telehealth? I'm like, heck yeah, I've got a, I've got a nice <laughs> awesome. camera here. Yeah. So I'm, yeah. I'm in the same boat, you know? Um, yeah. So that's a, that's a crucial point though uh, on engagement. How has your perspective of healthcare changed through this experience? Well, a great question. I, this is probably the perfect example. And, and it's a lot of what I talk about with our senior executives and I've given quite a number of talks, you know, it, it, it comes back to that alignment. You know, when we finally had alignment of a technology with an operational drive with a clear business layer, mm -hmm. it, it was just a home run. So, you know, we're starting to look at some other things now, you know, another thing we've been trying to get off the ground for a while are e-consults, the inner, inner, inner professional consults. Um, you know, I might see you in my primary care clinic and refer you to a derm mm. doctor and without you even seeing the derm doctor, you, you get a, you, you get a, uh, asynchronous consult. Uh, there's a huge role for that. Uh, and again, finally we have some alignment and we've got a clear business understanding. Um, a lot of the extended care team, I think of care coordinators, case managers, uh, other folks doing population health work, you know, the team that surrounds the provider. Some of that's become clear and more aligned uh, as, as we've been through this pandemic. So, uh, you know, I talk a lot to my operational folks and I, sometimes I take the technology out of things and it's just, you know, what right. are we trying to do? What's, what's the business model for it? How do we scale it? This is, this has been in some ways a blueprint for that. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm, I love to hear those things. Well, Dr. Anthony Dunnigan, thank you so much for your time today. Brandon, thank you. It's a privilege to be able to share some of our story. Great talking to you. I appreciate it.